Traumatic head injuries are some of the most difficult patients that we'll deal with as an EMS provider. And tonight we're going to look at part one of the evidence-based guidelines that we can follow in order to improve the outcomes, improve the chances of outcomes with these already high mortality patients with this evidence-based practice of adult traumatic head injury care. Let's check it out. Unfortunately, with these particular patients, they're a really complicated patient and the chances of mortality or long-term deficits of these patients is already very, very high. Fortunately though, EMS can be directly related to the positive outcomes of these patients with the early treatment that we do in order to essentially give these patients the best chance of, of positive outcomes. And so that's what we're gonna be talking about today. We're gonna to talk about, again, part one of this is gonna be talking about the airway and the breathing side of this and how we can manage that patient that way. And then part two, what comes out next week is gonna be talking about the circulation and some of the other types of things that we're gonna do, like using TXA, like using dextrose, like using things like hyperosmolars in order to draw fluid out and decrease the chances of increasing ICP. So we're gonna talk about this in two separate sides, so let's get into it. Okay, so let's start off with airway. One of the things that we need to be aware of with airways is that a single episode of hypoxia dramatically decreases the uh, positive outcomes of these patients. And my hypoxia is identified of a saturation below 90%. When we have a saturation below 90%, uh, 90% again, it decreases the chances of a positive outcome with these particular patients. And so this is something that we need to be aware of when it comes to airway management. And it's not like these hypoxia events actually happen at a rare occurrence. In fact, hypoxia happens anywhere between 25 to 55% of these traumatic head injury patients. So again, this is something that we need to be aware of. It's something that we need to be monitoring because even the slightest, even the smallest amount of hypoxia with these patients can be detrimental to their outcomes. And so we need to be very diligent, very highly hypervigilant of these patients and making sure that hypoxia is not part of this patient's equation. So that way, again, we improve the outcomes or the chances of a better outcome for these patients. So when it comes to the treatment of these particular patients is that we are going to make sure that we give high flow oxygen and treat any possible hypoxia. So that's gonna be likely treating with a, a non-rebreather mask if you have a spontaneously breathing patient. If you don't, or they're not able to manage their own airway and at a basic level, at least we're gonna to start to assist them with bag valve mass ventilation, mechanical ventilation in order to improve ventilation, improve the oxygenation in our patients, and ultimately keep them from going hypoxic and decreasing the chances of a positive outcome. That's the first thing. Now the next thing is if you need to go to intubation. Now this is a good information for not only a basic provider, but obviously an advanced provider here. And when it comes to an intubation, there's things that we're gonna be looking at in order to decide whether or not we're gonna intubate this patient. One of them being that the hypoxia that isn't corrected by supplemental auction. So when we first off go with the treatment of a non-rebreather or a BVM in order to correct the hypoxia that's occurring and we have a patient that's just simply not ventilating themselves, we're not able to manage that airway with basic maneuvers, then we need to seriously consider an intubation attempt in order to correct that. Because again, we know the longer this patient stays in a hypoxic situation, the more danger it is. And the longer we put off intubation, the more likely that patient's gonna go hypoxic and go further hypoxic during that intubation attempt. So we need to be aware of that as well when we're considering this. Another thing is that we have a patient that's not spontaneously breathing, they're hypoventilating, and we want to improve ventilation so that way we limit the chances of hypoxia. Of course, is another reason that we might consider intubation. And a GCS below eight suggesting a severe traumatic brain 
injury. Again, GCS was designed in order to determine the neurological status of a patient. Uh, just because they're below a, a number eight on the GCS scale does not mean that we should intubate these patients. It doesn't mean we should intubate any patient, but we should be using it in order to determine a trending amount of change in the neurological events. Because if they originally were at a GCS 14 and now they've trended downwards and now they've become a GCS of seven, GCS of six, that's an important finding for you as a provider to say, hey, okay, we've had a major change in neurological status. We need to seriously consider an advanced airway on these patients. And inability to maintain their adequate airway, obviously, again, if they can't maintain their own airway, then they're gonna obviously become hypoxic at some point so we need to start considering intubation then as well now one thing that we should take in consideration when the studies are showing us that if the patient is within 10 minutes of a receiving hospital for this patient it is not indicated to actually intubate this patient the studies show that the patient is either has an equal or decreased chance of survival or at least positive outcome if we elect to intubate this patient when we're within a 10 minute range of this the a hospital that can deal with this patient so that's something to again look at as well is a time factor if you're in a rural setting that might be a better indication for intubation as opposed to an urban setting where you're very close to your receiving facility that can handle this patient as well. So those are all things you need to be looking at is, is this patient at risk for a hypoxic event because they're in unable to manage their own airway, they're hypoventilating, and I've used other basic treatments in order to improve their ventilation and their oxygenation, and they're still going hypoxic that I need to seriously consider an advanced airway on these patients. Now, a big thing about intubations, let's say we're going down that route. One thing that we need to be looking at for uh, intubations, or two things I guess I should say, is two considerations, is that if we intubate these patients just as they are at that very moment, we can actually cause some very serious problems, okay? What we know is that any event of a decrease from a systolic pressure below 90 or below 65, we actually double the mortality rates every single time they stay below 90 or have a a hypotensive event and so what's important with these intubations is that we need to make sure that they don't go hypotensive and so we need to resuscitate them prior that could mean some a little bit of fluids and that could mean starting a levofed drip in order to maintain vessel squeeze during this intubation attempt. Because naturally, because of the ventilation, because of that apneic event that we're creating, they are going to cause vasodilation. And sometimes the drugs that we use are gonna cause vasodilation. And in this patient being so important that we keep them normal or at least a slightly hypertensive is vital to their survival. We wanna make sure that we're avoiding any chance that they go hypotensive using things like fluid and levofluid fed in order to improve the blood pressure in order to maintain that to make sure that we don't have a hypotensive event uh, during this intubation and the second thing in order to kind of kind of hit that nail on the head when it comes to the uh, when it comes to that hypotensive event using drugs that are less vasoactive meaning drugs that like Versed um, that are in the benzodiazepine type of realm of things cause vasodilation things like fentanyl now cause a small amounts of vasodilation and those are the kind of things we may want to avoid in this type of patient and so using something like ketamine is likely a better choice because it's been proven that it doesn't cause any detrimental effects to the intracranial pressures that or it originally thought it did so using things like ketamine are a better choice in this particular situation again to avoid the detrimental decreases in blood pressure that ultimately cause higher mortality rates in our patients and so those are your considerations when it comes to intubation if you're seriously considering that route and you're far enough away from a hospital that it can improve your income your outcomes for your patients Okay, so now we're going to say that we have a patient that has an inability to ventilate themselves. We'll say that we haven't done this intubation yet and we are attempting to maintain this patient's ventilation. What we want to do in those kind of situations, again, we want to limit the chances of a hypoxic event. So we're going to start off by using a 
a high flow oxygen in a non rebreather in order to maintain oxygenation at an adequate levels, making sure that we don't go below 90% saturation that again increases our mortality rates. So that's the first thing. But let's say this patient is not breathing appropriately. They're not doing well on their own because a lot of these patients obviously will have an altered mental status. They often are hypoventilating themselves and don't have great adequate airways. And so we may need to assist with their ventilations using a bag valve mask and using that bag valve mask we can assist with ventilations now typically we're going to try and shoot for a ventilation between 10 and 12 breaths per minute and that might seem kind of shocking because like wait a minute in traumatic brain injuries aren't i supposed to hyperventilate our patient and the answer to that is most of the time almost all of the time no we do not hyperventilate our patients and let's talk about why so when it comes to the ventilation patients, these hyperventilation patients, we've always been taught that, especially if you've been EMS for quite some time, or you might be still taught to hyperventilate these patients. But the truth of the matter is that what we've discovered over the last 10 years is that hyperventilation is actually really, really bad for these traumatic brain injuries. In fact, it actually increases our mortality rates quite a bit. The theory was, is that if we hyperventilate these patients, we decrease that end tidal CO2, what that in turn will do, will cause cerebral vasoconstriction. So ultimately it's going to cause cerebral vasoconstriction. And the thought of that is that it would decrease the intracranial pressures and then in turn slow the progression of the damage on the brain. The problem with this though, is that if by decreasing our, or vasoconstricting and decreasing, yes, maybe decreasing our ICP a little bit, ultimately what we're doing is we're decreasing blood flow. We're decreasing blood flow, those injured areas, means that we have decreased nutrients, decreased oxygen, decreased glucose to those cells that are damaged or are stressed. And that's just not something that's going to help this patient. And so we don't have, or we're not seeing great outcomes with these patients that we just ultimately hyperventilated at a very early stage. And so that's why with this idea of hyperventilating a patient is just simply out of the, the realm of things that we're doing anymore. Not on, on top of that, are we not seeing any positive outcomes with it? And is that we're actually seeing interesting changes. And so when we decrease, okay, and then title, CO2, when we decrease that, what that's going to do is cause a, this patient to go into an alkalosis. Okay, it's gonna cause this patient to go into an alkalosis. Now with that alkalosis, it's actually going to cause a shift, a leftward shift in an oxygen dissociation curve. And what that means is that we have less dissociation from oxygen to red blood cells. Now in the simplest terms, what that means is that even though we might have oxygen attached to these red blood cells, in an alkalotic environment, what happens is that we have a difficulty detaching that oxygen and feeding cells. And so that oxygen tends to be more affinity or more attached to those red blood cells and decreasing the chances of nutrients getting to the cells in an alkalytic environment. And so that's again, another reason why we want to avoid hyperventilation in patients that have traumatic brain injuries unless they go into a herniation state, which we're gonna talk about in part two. So that brings me back to our breathing question. What are we gonna do? Is that again, we're gonna ventilate these patients at a breath, uh, breathing rate of 10 to 12 breaths per minute. We're going to maintain, and this is a better idea to maintain our ventilations. The best thing to monitor that is our end tidal CO2. And that end tidal CO2 should be maintained between 35 and 40. So on the, the lower half of normal is what we're going to be shooting for, 35 to 40, and maintaining an SpO2 of 90%. Those are the two key things that we're gonna be looking at from a basic level. Again, on the airway side, making sure that our patient's maintaining their airway. If they are not, then we're gonna use basic 
considerations and basic tools in order to maintain that. If you're an advanced provider and have the ability to actually do an intubation or do an RSI, then we're gonna make sure that we're looking at those considerations, considering resuscitation prior to that intubation and using less vasoactive drugs. And then also on the breathing side of things, we're gonna make sure that we're not hyperventilating our patients. And the best way to do that is make sure that our end tidal CO2 stays between normal ranges between 35 and 40 and maintaining an SpO2 above 90% to limit the chances of hypoxia. So those are the two big things that we're going to do first off with these particular patients and managing these traumatic brain injuries that are occurring. And so what we're going to do is we're going to stop there for just a moment and make sure that you kind of let that sink in, make sure you understand how we're managing the A's, how we're managing the B's of these patients. And then next week, we're going to start getting into the circulation side of things, managing cerebral perfusion pressures, making sure that we're using hyperosmolar medications in order to pull some of that fluid and help some of this intracranial pressure and of course we're going to talk about TXA and the early use of it and how it's generated better outcomes for these particular patients so make sure that you check out this article on the GEMS magazine online it's called the evidence-based guidelines for adult traumatic brain injury care this is part one of that video series that's going with this article and part two will come out next week on Monday to finish it off and talk more about the circulation and using different uh, advanced medications in order to improve these outcomes further for these very tricky patients we'll see you next week